Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be solving a Diophantin equation. If you like this video, please comment, like and subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. And let's get started. So we do have x squared minus xy plus y squared is equal to x plus y. And we are looking for integer solutions. That's why we call this a Diophantin equation. A Diophantin equation has integer solutions and a lot of times we have fewer equations than the number of variables. So in this case, we have two variables and a single equation. If you were trying to solve this for real numbers, obviously there would be infinitely many solution pairs. But we're looking for integer solutions. That's what makes it a Diophantin equation. Okay, cool. Now, we do have x squared minus xy plus y squared on the left-hand side. Notice that it is part of an expression. If you think about uh, your algebra, factoring, formulas, identities, so on and so forth. What does this look like? This looks like part of uh, sum of two cubes or difference of two cubes. Since it's a minus sign, it's the other factor of this would be x plus y, which is, by the way, on the right-hand side. So, in other words, you could actually go ahead and multiply both sides by x plus y. And if x plus y is equal to zero, would that cause a problem? Well, you're multiplying by zero, so you've got to be careful here when we multiply both sides by x plus y, I'm assuming that x plus y does not equal zero. Okay, so something like that. So suppose you multiply this expression by x plus y, so you it would look like this, x plus y multiply by x squared minus xy plus y squared. And then on the right-hand side, since you're multiplying x plus y by itself, it would just be x plus y quantity squared, right? Okay, cool. Now, how does this help us? Well. The left-hand side is going to simplify because remember, we said something about sum of two cubes. This is exactly x cubed plus y cubed, right? Okay, cool. So we have x cubed plus y cubed, which is equal to x plus y quantity squared. Okay, cool. Now, how do we proceed, right? We're, we have two numbers whose sum squared is equal to the sum of their cubes. Now, if you think about this, and I think this will make more sense if you go back to uh, the formulas that we learned for the sum of consecutive integers. Remember that? How do you add, for example, something like 1 plus 2? Or was it the other way around? Okay, let, let's think about it. What is 1 cubed plus 2 cubed, right? Isn't that equal to 9? Okay, cool. What happens if I just add 1 plus 2 and then square it, right? Wow, I get 9 again. Is that an identity? Yep, that is true. So basically, this identity works for consecutive sums. Of course, it needs to start at one, right? So basically, what I'm trying to say here is that one cubed plus two cubed plus dot, 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 all the way to n cubed is the same as one plus two plus dot, 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 all the way up to n quantity squared. You know that this is an identity. That's how we find the sum of cubes, right? So the sum of cubes formula is just going to be n times n plus 1 divided by 2 quantity squared. Okay, and you can write it in different ways, of course. So that's the formula. So seems to be working with 1 and 2, right? So, well, it just allows you to guess and check some solutions, obviously. In this case, 1 comma 2 is definitely a solution, right? I mean, we can safely say that 1 comma 2 is a solution, but it's only one of the solutions. But I want to look for all the solutions. How am I going to find all the solutions? So we need a general approach, right? Can we take it from here and find a general approach? Possibly something to think about, right? So I'm going to leave that open. But I'd like to show you something different. What is that something different? A different method, right? This is not what I'm planning to do. I'm planning to do this problem a little differently. And that involves some really nice manipulations in algebra. That's why I like this problem. I mean, Diophantin equations, a lot of them can be solved if they're not too hard, and some are really hard to solve. And some have no solutions, some have infinitely many solutions, some have a number of solutions. This one particularly has a number of solutions, not infinitely many or no solutions case, okay? How do we go about solving it? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Instead of multiplying both sides by something, I'd like to put everything on the same side. So that's my plan. And then I'm going to manipulate that equation and turn it into something like a sum of squares. Now, how am I going to do that? And what is that going to 
uh, give me? Like, how is that gonna help? You'll see in a little bit. So let's go ahead and dive in and put everything on the left-hand side, okay? So let's go ahead and bring the x plus y to the left. So I will have x squared minus xy plus y squared minus x minus y is equal to zero. Awesome. So this is my plan. I'm going to turn this into a sum of squares. And you know that if you have a sum of squares equals zero, that means that every factor or every term, I should say rather, not factor, but every term in the sum uh, is equal to zero because if you're looking for real solutions, then you can't get uh, zero from sum of positives, right? So they all have to be zero. Obviously, they're not, there's not gonna be any negative term after being squared. So that's kind of like the plan, not exactly, but a lot of times we use this trick in algebra where we try to turn uh, something like this into a sum of squares. But as it is, this is not ready to be a sum of squares. So I, I'd like to do something first, which is multiply both sides by two. Okay, now why do we multiply by two? Because that's gonna give you some squares. All right, let's do it. And again, this is kind of like first trial and error. You try different methods. If that doesn't work, you can use modular arithmetic for diophantine equations. Check both sides by mod three, five, seven, whatever. And then argue that there are no solutions or there are infinitely many solutions. Okay, cool. Now, how can I turn this into a sum of squares? So one of the things that I notice is that the negative 2xy. That's actually why I multiply both sides by 2, because I'd like to get negative 2xy, because along with x squared and y squared, that is going to make a perfect square. Okay, cool. So now I should take the x squared minus 2xy and then the y squared. This is going to be one of the perfect squares. Now, I have some leftover terms, obviously. For example, I have x squared, right? So what am I going to do with that one? Well, you got to pair it up with something so that you can make a perfect square or you can complete the square. Well, I do have negative 2x. I don't have any other xy term or anything besides 2x that I can use. So this tells me, okay, what am I supposed to add? How do you find which term to add? You take the coefficient of x, divide by 2, and square. So half of 2 squared, which is 1. So I'm supposed to add 1 to both sides, and it's going to make this x minus 1 quantity squared. Okay, cool. Now, I also have a y squared left over, then, and negative 2y. Similarly, I can just add 1 to both sides. But what did I do here? I had no numbers on the left-hand side, no constants. Everything was a variable. So by adding 1 plus 1, I actually added 2 to the left-hand side of the equation. But I can't just do it, right? I mean, you don't have the flexibility of just adding any number. You have to do it on both sides. So I have to add 2 to the right-hand side, but I have 0, so that's going to make 0 plus 2, which is equal to 2. And this should complete the squares. But let's write each one as perfect squares, and then we're going to proceed with the solution. So how do I proceed? Well, the first three terms gives me x minus y quantity squared, and then I get x minus 1 quantity squared, and then I get 1, I mean y minus 1 quantity squared, and the whole thing is equal to 2. Well, in this case, we did not get a 0, which is fine, and if we did get a 0, uh, that would be kind of more limited. Suppose you have 0 on the right-hand side, what would you say, right? Well, each factor needs to equal to 0, so that would mean x minus y is equal to 0, x minus x minus y is equal to 0, x minus 1, and y minus 1 are both equal to 0, which would mean that 1 comma 1 is the only solution. So yes, there's a different version of this problem with, um, you know, 0 on the right-hand side, and the only solution is 1 comma 1. Okay. But in this case, we have more solutions. And how do you find those solutions? So this is what you need to think about. Well, these are integers, obviously, and the sum of three squares is equal to two. So what, is that, what does that mean? Well, if each of these squares is one, then one plus one plus one is three. So you can't have that, right? I mean, at least one of them needs to be a zero. And the other one can be one and one. Now, can a perfect square, can the square of an integer be two? No, then we're not allowed to make two of these zero. We can only make one of them zero. Okay, cool. So then one of the 
ways to look at it is basically you can safely say that, okay, I want x minus y to be zero, in which case x would equal y. Cool. If x is equal to y, what happens? If x is equal to y, that term is going to be zero, then this sum is going to be two, the sum of these two terms. And then what is that supposed to mean? Let's go ahead and take a look at it. And don't forget that y is equal to x. So we're talking about the same thing. So instead of y minus 1, I can just write x minus 1. And I know that this equals 2, right? Well, it just means that 2 times the quantity x minus 1 squared is equal to 2, which means x minus 1 squared is equal to 1. And as you know, there are two numbers whose square equals 1. And those numbers are 1 and negative 1, right? Okay, cool. So... This means that x can be 2 or x can be 0. Now, you got to be careful here. Our initial assumption was that x equals y. So if x equals 2, y equals 2. If x equals 0, y equals 0. So this basically covers the case that when x and y are equal, they're both either, they're either they're both 0 or both 2. So 0, 0 and 2, 2 are solutions then. Right? Okay. So that basically covers the x minus y equals zero case. So we're kind of looking at it case by case, right? Okay. And one of the things that I want you to notice is that since none of these can exceed one, so if you look at each term here after being squared, it can't exceed one. So you could possibly look at the following as well. So you can say that, okay, I want x minus y squared to be one, right? So then from here, because in this case, uh, one of the other ones will be, of course, one as well. So something like either this one is going to be one and this one is going to be zero. Or it could be that x minus one squared is zero and y minus one squared is equal to one. That way, we can basically get one plus one equals two. Okay, so if you look at these cases, for example, if you take the first one, this means there are two solutions to this one, right? It either x minus one is equal to one or x minus, I mean, x minus y. x minus y is equal to one or x minus y is equal to negative one. Now, if x minus y is equal to one, that means that the difference between x and y is one. Okay, so how can I write that? Well, I could possibly say that x is equal to y plus one. If you plug it into this equation, for example, then you would be getting y plus 1 minus 1 squared is equal to 1. So that would give you y squared is equal to 1. From here, y can be 1 or y can be negative 1. Okay? Now, does that work with the other equation? Because this equation also needs to be satisfied, right? Well, if y is 1, it works. If y is negative 1, it just doesn't work. But we have to have them at the same time. So we're actually going to discard this solution. So this means that if x minus y is equal to 1, then we can ha safely say that y is equal to 1. And then in this case, x would be a 2. Why? Because our formula tells us that x is equal to y plus 1. So that gives us the solution 2 comma 1, right? That's just another solution 2 comma 1. Cool. Let's take a look at this one now. This means that x is equal to y minus 1. If you plug it in to one of these equations, for example, um, which one I want to use. Okay, I can use this one again. And this would give me y minus 2 squared is equal to 1. Well, from here, y minus 2 is either 1 or y minus 2 is equal to negative 1. This means that y is equal to 3, but we know that y is equal to 3 is not acceptable because that's going to give us 2 squared, which is 4, right? So this is not acceptable. The other case is going to give us y equals 1. Would this work? Probably because it would work for this one, and for this one, it would give me x equals 0. So if y equals 1, x is equal to 0, which gives us the ordered pair 0, 1. So 0, 1 is another solution, obviously. So, so what I did here was basically I went this path, now we can go this path, all right? So basically by substitution, simple substitution, you can do the following. But you can also think about it this way. None of the numbers here can exceed uh, 2, right? The highest value for x or y can be 2. Why? Because if x is or y is greater than 2, then x minus 1 or y minus 1 is going to be greater than uh, 1, right? Uh, so let's say something like, if suppose x equals 3, right? Uh, then you would have 
2 squared, which is 4. So you can't use anything greater than 2, basically. So that kind of limits our options to a number of solutions. And to keep a long story short, I think I kept this too long, we have the 0, 0, 2, 2, 2, 1. We should also have a 0, 1, 1, 0. And then I have the 1, 2, okay, because that also works. And I think that gives us all the solutions. So that is a total of six solutions to this equation. That brings us to the end of this video. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow with another video. Be safe, take care, bye-bye.